COVID jabs may be needed annually. More than 100 million extra doses of vaccine have been ordered over the next two years. The deal allows for vaccines to be modified to tackle any new variants. As the Prime Minister has his booster, he tries to clear up confusion about Christmas parties, saying they should go ahead. It's really nice to feel a bit of sense of normality again and it's a struggle working from home constantly by yourself. Why am I wearing a mask in a taxi but I'm coming to a party with hundreds of people and not wearing a mask? It's, that's why people are confused, it's not making any sense. The new variant is now in 24 countries. Germany announces sweeping restrictions for anyone who's not been vaccinated. Also tonight. The death of six-year-old Arthur Lavigno Hughes, who was starved and tortured. His stepmother is found guilty of his murder, his father of manslaughter. The Duchess of Sussex wins her privacy case against the publisher of the Mail on Sunday after it printed parts of a letter she'd written to her father. The army is called on to help in the wake of Storm Arwen. Nearly 20,000 people still have no electricity in Scotland and Northern England. Hello, Sam! Um. And it's nearly Boxing Day. We talk to the stars of the new British Christmas rom-com. And coming up on the BBC News Channel, he has his work permit, but Ralph Ranjek won't be in the dugout for Manchester United against Arsenal tonight. Instead, Michael Carrick takes charge for the last time. Hello, good evening. Welcome to the BBC News at six. Covid jabs could be needed every year, with the government confirming that it's ordered 114 million more doses from Pfizer and Moderna to be delivered over the next two years. The deal allows for vaccines to be modified to tackle new variants of coronavirus if necessary. The government says the order future-proofs the country's vaccination programme. Cases of the Omicron variant have now been confirmed in at least 24 countries, including 10 cases here in the UK, with Germany tonight announcing sweeping new restrictions for anyone who's not been vaccinated. Here's our medical editor, Fergus Walsh. Booster after booster after booster. The UK has just ordered enough vaccines for repeat doses next year and in 2023, should they be needed. All are the so-called mRNA vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna. Whether they'll need to be tweaked for the Omicron variant is still unclear. The focus right now is getting this round of boosters into arms. The Prime Minister had his at the hospital that saved his life last year. I'm lucky. Here we go. St Thomas's in London, where he was admitted into intensive care with Covid. Whatever Omicron may or may not be able to, to do, it certainly will not negate the overall value of the, of the boosters. So everybody should get your, your booster as soon as you'll call forward. Pfizer, like the other vaccine makers, is already working on an Omicron-specific COVID vaccine, which could be ready in three months. Hi, Mr. Buller. Hello, hello. Welcome. Welcome. How are you? In a rare interview, the boss of Pfizer told me he thought regular boosters would be needed. If we have to make a guess based on everything I have seen so far, I would say that likely will be needed annual revaccinations to maintain very robust and very, very high level of protection. In the United States, five to 11 year olds are now being immunized against COVID. You wanna give Bailey a treat? Therapy dogs providing a useful distraction. A decision on this age group in the UK may come before Christmas. They'd receive a third of a standard dose. It all means bigger and bigger profits for Pfizer. Revenues from its vaccine will exceed £26 billion this year. What would you say to those who regard it as immoral to cash in during a pandemic? I believe that uh, we have saved the global economy trillions of dollars. I think it's a strong incentive for innovation for the next pandemic that people will see that if they stepped up to the game, 
to bring something that saves lives, that saves money, there is also financial reward. Pfizer's three billionth dose came off the production line today. Four billion are planned next year. It's a race against time with Omicron cases identified in more countries like India and France. In Germany, where Delta cases are soaring, sweeping new restrictions have been announced for those unvaccinated, which will see them barred from many public places. Meanwhile, the UK has approved a new antibody drug, which dramatically cuts the risk of severe illness. Initial tests suggest it will work against Omicron. It's not just vaccines, but treatments, which will end this pandemic. Fergus Walsh, BBC News. Well, businesses have been calling for greater clarity from the government about whether people should go to Christmas parties as restaurants and hotels report customers cancelling reservations. The Prime Minister insisted this afternoon that events should go ahead. So what are people and bosses meant to do? Our consumer affairs correspondent Coletta Smith has been talking to party goers, among others. What are people telling you, Coletta? Well, I've just had confirmed today that the big Manchester fashion brand Boohoo have decided to postpone their party until the spring. Other companies clearly following suit. Other big names, NatWest, Aviva, Deloitte, have all decided to scale down their parties instead. So to have smaller team-based gatherings instead of a whole big work crew getting together. But everyone that I've spoken to today has been aware of that mixed messaging coming from government, whether we should scale down plans, stick to smaller groups or go ahead with those big Christmas parties. Uh, but also people have been stressing the importance of those physical gatherings, not just for team building and morale, but really for individuals' mental health, people that have been working separately for such a long time. So the tables are booked, the deposits are paid, and the Christmas jumpers are coming back out of the wardrobes. The party season is in full swing, and staff from this company have come out in force. We give everybody the choice whether they wanted to carry on in the UK. They've all decided to, to come, um, which we're absolutely delighted about. And then we've got this, and then we're out for a nice meal this evening. The drinks, the dips and the darts are all helping conversations flow. We haven't been together for, what, over a year, really, as a company. Yeah. So really important, yeah, really good. Last week when we had all the new rules with COVID, I thought it's going to get cancelled, but yeah, I've been lucky enough to still go ahead, which has been great. They have had a few cancellations here at this darts bar in the last few days, but are hoping last-minute walk-ins will fill those gaps. At the moment, we're seeing mostly groups of around 50. And some of the biggest we have are around 100 for this Christmas. We have seen some bigger ones previously. Um, I'm not sure if it's a case of splitting down into departments and coming in smaller groups or them not having the party in the first place. The government haven't changed any of the rules around meeting in big groups. It's up to individual companies to decide whether or not they want to go ahead, but some firms are taking small steps to try and mitigate that risk, making people do lateral flow tests, perhaps meeting in smaller groups, in better ventilated venues, just to try and make everyone feel more comfortable. I think it is scary with the masks, you know, coming back in, but I don't think it should affect Christmas doers now. Yeah. I mean, you're working with each other anyway, so you're going to be in proximity. I think it's very important, especially in jobs where you actually work remotely anyway. So when you're looking forward to getting together, it's one thing that everyone's looking forward to, aren't they, for the whole year, so yeah. We've been here since 4am this morning, loading in all the lighting, the sound, all the equipment, and then all like the props. The Holly organises Christmas dues at the other end of the scale, the massive ones for big global brands. There'll be 300 people on this dance floor tonight. They're at the point where everything's organised and booked, they don't want to cancel, so we're doing another event today for 100 people, a conference and a party. We'll be doing small private dinings for like 20 people. Like, they were, just People want to be together and they want the... Christmas dinner and the crackers and everything, don't they? With just over three weeks to go until the big day, plenty of companies are taking a punt on a safe and successful night out. Coletta Smith, BBC News in Manchester. Well, let's talk as well to our political editor, Laura Koonsberg, in Westminster. We hear about confusion, people confused about their own Christmas parties. Laura, is the government message that the Prime Minister's trying to get across here also undermined because there's still talk about a Christmas party a year ago? 
Well, Jane, we have had anger about what went on in Downing Street 12 months ago. We spoke yesterday to an attendee of a gathering who said there'd been several dozen people at an event there with food and drink that went on until the early hours. Labour's calling for an investigation into that. Relatives of people who lost their lives to COVID have said they're sickened to hear what allegedly went on. But Downing Street just does not want to get into this conversation. They've refused to give details of what happened. Boris Johnson hasn't denied it, but did not want to get any further into conversation about that today. But in terms of the wider picture about what people are meant to do now, well, the, the government is clear on one thing. They do say that people should not be cancelling their events. But beyond that, it has been a bit of ministers being at odds with each other. One minister said that people shouldn't snog people they don't know. Another minister said in the last hour or so, people can snog whoever they like. It's none of the government's business. I'd like to emphasise that's their choice of vocabulary, not ours. But this isn't some kind of game of, you know, snog, attend or avoid. There's a serious point here because we are living with, as yet, an unknown level of threat from this new variant, Omicron. And because of that, the government, yeah, they have been tightening up restrictions. They are urging people to be cautious, but they are not yet at the stage where they're going to bring back the kind of super strict guidelines that did really keep all sorts of controls over so much of our behaviour. Everybody hopes they're not going to have to get to that stage. But until the situation with the new variant becomes more clear, we are in a bit of a waiting game where there is, I'm afraid to say, going to be some room for interpretation over the rules. But the government's rivals would say that's why it's so vital that ministers stick to exactly the same message and exactly the same language so that families and businesses around the country trying to plan their Christmas can be absolutely sure what the best thing is to do. Laura. Thank you very much. And let's take a look at the latest coronavirus figures as well. Across the UK, they show there were nearly 54,000 new infections recorded in the latest 24-hour period. 141 deaths were recorded. That's someone who dies within 28 days of a positive COVID test. And in terms of vaccinations, just over 19 million people have now had their booster jab. And now in the rest of tonight's news. And a woman has been convicted of murdering her six-year-old stepson last year. The boy's father has been found guilty of his manslaughter. As the UK was in lockdown, Arthur Lavigneau Hughes was starved, tortured and neglected by Emma Tustin and Thomas Hughes before dying of a head injury last June. During the trial at Coventry Crown Court, the couple were described as utterly ruthless and pitiless. An independent review is underway into the actions of social workers who'd visited the family two months before Arthur died. I must warn you that this report from Phil Mackey contains video and audio recordings of Arthur which were played in court as evidence and it is distressing. Arthur Labinho Hughes had been a healthy and happy little boy but he was subjected to months of beatings and punishments by his stepmother Emma Tustin and father Thomas Hughes. I tried to claim a six-year-old stepson he's fallen and he's banged his head okay. and while he was on the floor he's banged his head another five times. Tustin lied when she dialed 999 and she dialed 999 and when the police arrived, she continued trying to say that Arthur's injuries were self-inflicted. So you come in, he's banged his head three or yeah, four times here. I was in the living room, here. I was in the kitchen, then I'd sat down in the living room and you heard, threw himself on the floor. And you heard him banging heard his, him head. Bang his head. But the evidence of cruelty was undeniable. The pair had filmed some of his suffering. This shows Arthur on the day he died, so weak he could barely stand and walk. During the trial, jurors listened to the hundreds of audio recordings that Tustin made all of them extremely distressing. I think they are cold, calculating, systematic torturers of a defenceless little boy. They're wicked, evil. There's no word for them, especially your own child. In court, Tustin and Hughes blamed each other for what was described as systematic cruelty, but it was clear both were involved. It's been a really difficult and emotional case to have to deal with, but a really important one because ultimately I just wanted to make sure that there was justice for Arthur and his wider family. Arthur had gone to live in Tustin's house at the start of the first lockdown last year, and that's when the abuse escalated. 
Soon afterwards, Arthur's other grandmother, Joanne Hughes, took this photo. But social workers who investigated said it had appeared to be a happy household. There were other opportunities to intervene and perhaps save Arthur as well, but this was all going on during the very first lockdown last year when people were isolating and vulnerable children like Arthur became invisible. Arthur had already had a difficult start in life. His birth mother, Olivia Labino Halcrow, is in prison after being convicted of manslaughter in another case. An investigation is being carried out to see whether opportunities to save the little boy were missed. The tragic loss of a young boy in such terrible circumstances is dreadful. We send our heartfelt condolences to everybody affected. The circumstances around the death will be now subject of independent review. The review is due to be published next year. Sadly, whatever lessons are learned will come too late to save Arthur. You know, there was so much awful, disturbing material presented in this case. There were hundreds of audio recordings. There was hours of CCTV footage. There were texts and WhatsApp messages that were far more disturbing than anything you've just seen. It's been one of the hardest cases I've ever had to cover. And it was very difficult for the jurors who had to sit through two months of evidence here. After the defendants had been taken down, they passed a note to the judge asking for a moment's silence, for a minute's silence for Arthur. I've never known this happen in any case ever before. And sure enough, the judge and all the court staff and everybody in there, including Arthur's wider family, stood and observed that minute's silence. We'll be back here tomorrow, Jane. Tustin will get a mandatory life sentence, but Hughes will also be alongside her as they are sentenced by the judge. Phil Mackey, thank you. And the time is edging up to 17 minutes past six. Our top story this evening. Covid jabs may be needed annually. More than 100 million extra doses of vaccine have been ordered over the next two years. Still to come tonight, we hear about the struggle of disabled people who are finding it hard to get the personal assistants who are vital for their everyday life. Coming up in Sports Day on the BBC News Channel, the Women's Tennis Association has suspended all tournaments in China amid concern for Peng Shui. The chief executive said he had serious doubts the tennis player was free and safe. The Duchess of Sussex has won her legal fight against the publisher of the Mail on Sunday, which she brought after the paper printed extracts from a letter she'd written to her father. The Court of Appeal rejected Associated Newspapers' attempt to have a full trial in the case about privacy and copyright. Meghan described today's ruling as a victory for anyone who's ever felt scared to stand up for what's right. Associated Newspapers says it's considering an appeal. This report from our royal correspondent, Nicholas Witchell, contains some flashing images. Once again, a very clear victory for the Duchess of Sussex in her battle, in which she's been strongly backed by her husband, against the tabloid media. At the heart of this case is the publication by the Mail on Sunday of lengthy extracts from a letter the Duchess had written to her father three months after her wedding. At the time, relations between Meghan and her father were difficult. Earlier this year, a judge at the High Court in London decided the breach of privacy was so clear-cut there was no need for a full trial. The Mail on Sunday's publishers appealed against that ruling. Today, three judges in the Court of Appeal found that the original judge's decision was correct. The judge's careful decision, mostly on factual questions, was upheld. And it was hard to see what evidence could have been adduced at trial that would have altered that situation. The judges found that disclosures by Jason Knauf, Meghan's former communications advisor, that she'd written the letter knowing it might be leaked and that she'd asked him to brief the authors of a book were irrelevant. Within minutes, a statement was issued from Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex. She said, this is a victory not just for me, but for anyone who has ever felt scared to stand up for what's right. While this win is precedent-setting, what matters most is that we are now collectively brave enough to reshape a tabloid industry that conditions people to be cruel and profits from the lies and pain that they create. Associated Newspapers, the publishers of the Mail on Sunday, said they were very disappointed by the Court of Appeal's decision. 
It is our strong view, they said in a statement, that judgment should be given only on the basis of evidence tested at trial. No evidence has been tested under cross-examination. Associated newspapers say they are now considering an appeal to the Supreme Court. Nicholas Witchell, BBC News. Thousands of people in the north of England are facing a seventh night without power after Storm Arwen. Nearly 10,000 Northern Power Grid customers and close to 3,000 Electricity North West customers are still cut off. In Scotland, the army has been drafted in to support people in Aberdeenshire who've been without electricity for nearly a week. Fiona Trott has the latest from Cumbria. getting urgent help to the most vulnerable in the community. This fire station in Ulverston has turned into an emergency hub. At the end of the phones, the police, Madge and Rescue and Red Cross volunteers knocking on the doors of 600 properties. What we're actually doing is knocking on each door. We are identifying if that person is vulnerable, if they have any needs, have they got enough water, have they got enough clothing, are they warm enough, have they got enough food. Any areas that we find that they do need, whether it's support, whether it's reaccommodation, we are managing that as a team um, and, and delivering what they need to support their welfare. In Scotland, 130 military personnel have been brought in to help 12 villages in the Grampian region. They're not in the business of you know, repairing infrastructure or whatever else. Their job is to get out to those communities and just say, look, you're not forgotten about. Here's what's going on. Because a lot of people are without communications and that's quite unnerving, I think, for those communities. In rural Cumbria, they say military assistance would have been welcomed days ago. But now it's too late. And once again, it's the community that's filling in the gaps. This evening, some villagers in South Cumbria are anxious and they're angry. They've seen a major incident declared in neighbouring County Durham today, something they have been calling for since Saturday. Uh, and that means that more support can be provided on the ground. But that's because Northern Power Grid there say they can't confirm when electricity will be restored to all homes. Here it's a different story. Northwest Electricity have set an ambitious target. They're hoping to get the remaining 2,000 or so homes back on the grid by tomorrow and people see here say it couldn't come too soon more freezing weather is expected it's their seventh night for some of them without electricity fiona trot thank you Thousands of disabled people are struggling to recruit personal assistants who help them live independently because of pressures in the social care system. PAs, as they're known, help with vital day-to-day -day tasks. But with more than 100,000 vacancies in the care sector, many disabled people are finding it difficult now to get the support they need. Our disability news correspondent, Nikki Fox, has this report. When you have a disability, independence is crucial and it usually requires a bit of support. One option is to take control yourself. Like thousands of other disabled people, I employ personal assistants like Holly to help me do the things that I can't, like get my battered old scooter out of the back of my car. If I didn't employ PAs, there is no way I would be able to work to the extent that I do, let alone have a life. Division having more adverts. Sean uses PAs too. The 18-year-old A-level student gets funding from her local authority for support throughout the day and night. But at the moment, she's struggling to recruit the full team she desperately needs. We advertise and it is a very huge break of pay that me and my mum kind of worked on getting. But it's still like you just can't get anyone. What impact does it have on you? On the days I don't have them, I don't really do a lot. I just sort of watch TV or something because I can't physically do anything. I kind of feel a little bit trapped. Come on, Cody. Sean's mum has a lot on her plate. She rents out stables, runs a caravan park and has two other children. Yeah, yum, yum. The time she spends filling in to help Sean puts a strain on the family, both financially and emotionally. There isn't anyone. You can go to agency to fulfil the shortfall. That's the other option. But I know from contacting some myself, they wouldn't be able to fulfil it. How much is she doing this week then? Four. Four. Daytime or night time? I think they're mainly night. So you're not going to get to sleep much at all then? No. 
No. Sean and her mum are not alone. There are currently more than 100,000 vacancies in the care sector. Campaigners are calling for urgent changes to immigration rules, but experts say that's only one part of the problem. There is the, the Brexit issue in which some people are not moving into the UK and able to pick up this work. There is the issue of wages combined with cost of living so that perhaps you can't really afford to do the job that you like. So there are a number of factors creating this perfect storm. Who would not want the job of your PA? One, you're just really cool, and two, you've got miniature horses. The government says it's investing an additional £5.4 billion into social care over the next three years. But the body representing councils across England and Wales says that while extra funding will help, more investment is needed now to retain hard-working care staff. Yeah. I come and live with you. Sean just wants to go to uni. But given all the problems she's having now, she's worried she won't have enough support to make her dream of studying psychology a reality. Nikki Fox, BBC News. The Women's Tennis Association has suspended all tournaments in China amid concern for the Chinese tennis player Peng Shui. Peng disappeared from public view for three weeks after accusing a Chinese official of sexual assault, leading to fears for her safety. She has since told sports officials that she's safe and well, but the WTA says it has serious doubts that she's not being subject to intimidation. Now, move over Richard Curtis. There is a new Christmas rom-com in cinemas this year, and it's the first British one with an all-black cast. The London-born actor Amel Amin has written and directed Boxing Day, and he stars in it alongside the Little Mix singer Leanne Pinnock in her first film role. They've been speaking to our community affairs correspondent, Adina Campbell. I wanted to introduce you to my fiancé. Melvin! Georgia Filaron Show is your ex-girlfriend. I wanted to make a version of a kind of comedy slash everyday life of black people for about a decade. I just wanted to play characters that were slightly outside of the, um, the genre that was really popularized, which is the street genre. Wow, it's Georgia Filaron Show. One of the things I, I really like about our film is that we have a black opulent family who are professionals, and then I'm massively into rom-coms like My Best Friend's Wedding, what was like Notting Hill. This is a film mainly set in London, mm -hmm. led by an all-black cast, something you don't see very often. This is obviously the first of its kind and it's just so needed. It's, it's needed not just for our culture but for everyone. We have people from around the world in this film. Diversity is a buzzword but it's just genuinely we found great people and we made a concerted effort to lift up really talented people that had not yet got the opportunity. <laughs> Boxing Day is a British film first. If we can export that to the world and show the best of us, that's an amazing thing. So, Leanne, how excited were you when you saw the script? I felt like Georgia was a little bit like me anyway, so I thought, you know what, if this is going to be my first acting job, if I'm going to audition for this, then maybe this is actually fate. You had so much fun making this film. Two moments that stand out are the dancing in the living room to reggae. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And the cake throwing. It was literally like hanging out with your family. What you see in the movie is what it was. It was so much fun. It didn't feel like work. It was just like us all hanging out, catching mm. a vibe, you know. Catching a vibe. What are you doing blowing kisses to my missus on the ground? And the film really explores honesty and authenticity. Is that something that you reflected on with some of the personal experiences that you've gone through? Yeah, definitely. I think everyone has been in that situation where they have a sort of attachment to someone. They've, they're comfortable with someone and that sort of love is still kind of there. But actually, you do need to let go to grow. Could this be the end of Little Mix then? No, don't say such a thing. Little Mix forever. Little Mix forever. They are my, they are my everything. Here's the test. Favourite Little Mix song then? Boom. Shout out to my ex. Oh, Lord. <laughs> You really loved that one, didn't I did you? It. It's the only one he knows. <laughs> Melamine Leanne Pinnock there talking to Adina Campbell. Really is nearly Christmas, isn't it? Let's catch up with the weather, shall we? Uh, Louise Lear has joined me. Hi, Louise. Oh, we're all over the shot with the weather, aren't we, at the moment this week? Today, it has been glorious for many of us. Clear blue skies, 
but lighter winds, but bitterly, bitterly cold. Now, this was Buckinghamshire earlier on this afternoon. Temperatures struggled to get above uh, just a couple of degrees above freezing in many places. But we are flip-flopping once again tomorrow. There's going to be a lot more in the way of cloud coming through. But unfortunately, that does mean that it will be milder, but it will be a bit greyer as well. So let's take a look at just what is happening. It's these weather fronts that are spilling in off the Atlantic. Ahead of it, we will see an early frost into eastern England, but almost shaped like a, a pizza slice is this triangle of frontal systems. And that's the um, boundary for the milder air that's going to spill its way steadily south and east through the night tonight. So it does mean as it bumps into that cold air on the leading edge, we will see a combination of rain, sleet and snow. It will turn back to rain quite readily, perhaps a wintry mix into the southeast first thing tomorrow morning. And actually temperatures rising through the night. So first thing out to the west, it will be a relatively mild start with around 8 to 10 degrees. Chilly in the southeast, but that is not going to last. The showery rain eases away. Quite a lot of cloud generally through central and southern England, along with Northern Ireland. Perhaps northeast England and Scotland, some sunshine coming through and a scattering of showers. But as you can see, by the end of the afternoon, down towards southwest England and Wales, we'll see another spell of heavy rain. Milder for all tomorrow, perhaps likely to see temperatures back into double figures. Plenty of showers, though, developing up into the far northwest. So we'll see that rain trickling along the Channel Coast. These showers are going to be important, some of them turning heavy and quite widespread. More importantly, they're turning wintry. As the wind direction changes once again, we flip flop back to colder air and wintry showers possible, but plenty of sunshine for the weekend. Jane. All right, Louise, thanks very much. Louise Lear there. And that is it from the News at Six team for tonight. Goodbye from all of us on BBC One. Let's join our news teams now, wherever you are. Have a good evening. Bye bye.